Some of you might be familiar with a series called Shakespeare, the Animated Tales. It was a series of uh, foreshortened Shakespeare adaptations that were animated in a variety of styles. Uh, and I've just watched the Macbeth one for the first time, so I thought I'd quickly um, talk to you about it. Uh, so it's not feature length, it's about 25 minutes long. Um, and it's so sort of severely cut that they have to add in a, a narrator to kind of stitch everything together, which is kind of a shame when you're already losing so much Shakespeare to add in what amounts to quite bland prose narration. Um, I mean, the cuts really are um, severe. They, they even cut like rhyming couplets in half to save time. But it does give it a really, you know, breakneck pace. Um, everything is just about comprehensible, which is some doing when you're telling a, a story that usually takes, what, two and a half hours, three hours, um, maybe a bit shorter than that. Macbeth is a very short play, but half an hour is, is a tough, tough ask. Um, so, yeah, it's not exactly a, a version that you'd watch for the language. It's more about the visuals, obviously. Um, and the, the animating style is, is quite interesting. It reminds me of the films of Ralph Bakshi. I'm not sure if you um, have seen his films. He made the 70s Lord of the Rings. He made films like Cool World and Wizards. Um, he did this sort of, I think it's called rotoscoping. Um, I might be getting my terminology confused. But it's where you shoot live action footage and then um, draw over the cells. So it has this, it looks animated, but the frame rate is live action. It's kind of a trippy effect. It was used for a, a film, uh, A Scanner Darkly, a Philip K. Dick adaptation um, in about uh, mid-2000s. Anyway, um, there's parts of Macbeth that look like they're doing that, and then there are parts that look like kind of traditional animation. And it sort of jerks between the two, and the, the movement's really, really different. Um, and it's it looks odd. At times, it doesn't look deliberately odd. It looks sort of shoddy, to be honest, in places. Um, but in other other places, the the oddness really really works. The the cutting between um, really deliberate, traditionally animated movements and uh, the live action kind of gives you a sense of swapping from the clarity of history and fact to um, speculation. Uh, as Macbeth is wondering whether or not to kill Duncan, different potentialities are, are opening up. They're all swarming around in the mix, like in the witch's cauldron. Um, whereas once an act has been performed, that's the reality you're stuck with and uh, you know the environment starts to solidify. One of the things I enjoyed the most, and, and I think any uh, live action sort of full length film production or especially a stage production would envy is the kind of scene transitions that animation allows characters melting into shadows and the next scene um, being sort of painted over the top or, or characters melting into figurative imagery, thematic imagery, and that just leading on to the next scene seamlessly. I mean, that, a theatre director's got to look at that and go, God, if only you, can, you could do that in the, in the physical space. Obviously, there are ways you can, you can do things, but it's that much harder when you can't just uh, do, things, do things by the stroke of a pen. And also, like a Ralph Bakshi movie, it's full of crazy imagery. Um, some really, really out there stuff. Macbeth kind of looks um, satanic from the start. It kind of looks like a golem. He's got these this grey, almost like it looks like a cursed statue. Um, Lady Macbeth has this moment where she, uh, it's the uh, take my milk for gall speech. Her breasts seem to illuminate for a frame and out of her chest leaps... Um, a horde of monsters. They're really crazy. Moments like that happen quite frequently. And I really like that so much of the imagery was, um, you know, non-literal. And some of the more arguably accidental aspects of the style work too. So as you go from um, perhaps footage of a, of a real human's face that's animated over the top to, to a drawing, uh, the, the features on the face sort of slide around, like the eyes ooze up and down a little bit. There's moments where faces seem to glitch as eyes just disappeared. Um, there are d definitely deliberate moments where eyes would just sort of shatter like stained, whole face would shatter like stained glass and a, do a scene dissolve. Um, all of which sort of made all of, the, all of the characters, particularly Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, seem very fragile, seem like uh, players on a stage, which, which works brilliantly with Macbeth. It felt as well like almost all of, when, when multiple characters were in a scene, they often felt almost like they were drawn by different people or they, they were, they were coloured differently, um, like they were just in totally different stories. And 
I think that also helped with this aberration in the Scottish line where history's trying to almost try to figure out what's going to happen next. Each of these characters are almost illuminated as, as different possible outcomes but the pot's still stirring. They're all they're all sort of intermingled, and uh, that brings me on to the the bit that I think works best, or or and is perhaps the most interesting aspect of the imagery to address, which is the the backgrounds, the exteriors, which again a bit like a Ralph Bakshi movie. There is a lot of exteriors or backgrounds that were really just blurred textures, it, sort of impress, impressionistic signs of battlefields and castles and um, streaked fields or, or, or whatever it is, rather than detailed, literal uh, landscapes. You know, in a, in a play which asks, stands Scotland where it did? Where there's this question of what is Scotland's identity? Where are we? It's, it's as if the country itself is in turmoil or has been thrown into turmoil by, by this um, usurpation of Macbeth. The absence of anything locally and specifically Scottish and instead just a sort of vague haze of colour, um, I think also works really well. So yeah, like I say, it's not a version you would listen to for the language, although it does have Brian Cox uh, in the role of Macbeth. You'll, if you've watched Succession or if you're a fan of Brian Cox, you'll recognise his voice immediately. But by the virtue of being animated, it has a really uh, unique visual imagination, which um, it's really quite stimulating if you're, if you're a student of the play. Um, and if you want a version of Macbeth that you can watch in your lunch break, um, yeah, recommend it. And it's all on YouTube. I'll link it in the episode description box below.